Good morning. My name is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is May 21st, 2001. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Jack Shepard, Jr. Jack, good morning and welcome. Good morning. It's nice a pleasure to, have to be here. here. Uh, may I ask how old you are? 76. And your current address? In Dover, Massachusetts. And your current marital status? Happily married to Annabelle for 41 years. And do you have children, Jack? Three. Uh, grandchildren? Five. Five. Right. Any grand, uh, great-grandchildren? Not that old <laughs> yet. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Where were you born, Jack? I was born in Boston. And were you raised there? Your family raised In Brookline. You okay. And uh, can you tell us something about your family? What did your dad do? Well, my dad is a, uh, was, excuse me, a, uh, in the wool business after graduating from Lowell Tech in Lowell, Massachusetts. And also he owned a robe and housecoat company in Natick called New England Robe. And our trade name was Queenland. And uh, after the service, uh, I joined Dad at the Robin Housecoat Factory and were there for a good uh, 35 years, approximately. Um, we used to live in Natick, and for the past 31 years, we've been living in uh, Dover, even though three of my children did go to Natick High Schools and Natick Schools, and my son, uh, became the first Rhodes Scholar in the history of Natick or Framingham or Ashland, Kachichwood or Sherbin, ever. He's a Rhodes Scholar with President Bill Clinton. And my children are married, very happy. My youngest daughter lives on Nantucket, married a young man who was born on Nantucket. And one child lives in Wayland, one lives in Belmont, my son. I have three daughters and one son and my oldest lives in McLean, Virginia. And I'm retired now, of course, at my age. Very few people want a fellow who's 76, 77 years of age. It's, it's time you got some rest. <laughs> I've paid my dues, just like most of us. Can you remember what Natick was like when you first moved here? Well, yes. Uh, I moved here with my mother and father in, right after World War II in about 1946-47, if I recall correctly. And uh, the only thing that really has changed, I, I, in my estimation, is uh, there are many, many more people. Uh, and our shopping centers are in Natick, where Macy's and Filene's and Route 9 has really built up to a miracle mile out there. But uh, otherwise, it's still a very nice town. Did, so you graduated from school in Brookline? Brookline High School. Tell us about Brookline. What was Brookline like? That was Mike Dukakis's hometown. Oh, that's right, that's right. Uh, Brookline was a terrific school, and uh, we just had our first 50th reunion uh, in 1992. That was our first reunion we had, and I was sort of in charge of it. And I was going to, on my speech, which I never got to the reunion because of illness, but I was going to mention, and you say, what, what has changed? Um, I, I was going to say, who's better off, the, the boys and girls that are, gr that are graduating now in 1992, or we who graduated in 1942? Because when we graduated, uh, if we talked about grass, it was pertaining to cutting the lawn. If it talked about drugs, it was going to the drugstore to get a prescription filled. If it was about needles, it was about Victrola needles. Never did any high school in the United States of America, not much less Brookline, ever have detectors of the, in the, as you would go in the doors, a metal detector to see if you carried a gun or a knife. It's a new ball game today, of course, and uh, I don't know who's better off, the children of 1942 when we graduated or the ones that are graduating today. I think they're all brighter and they're more worldwide with computers, etc. You graduated in, in 1942. Right. That means the war had started a year previous or several months previous. 
take us back to being in high school and hearing that Pearl Harbor had been bombed and the nation was at war. I had never heard of Pearl Harbor. Uh, I was in the lunchroom on Monday morning at Brookline High when they put on the loudspeaker of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt saying that war had been declared because Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, you were a senior at that time? I was a uh, senior, that's right. Okay, what did you guys think uh, in terms of uh, the possibility of your being involved? It was completely different than future years with the Korean War or the uh, Vietnam War because we all tried to get in. We all wanted to serve. It was a world war. Nobody tried to avoid it. The ones that were called 4F because of some medical disability or mental disability, uh, many of them worked in shipyards. But in general, we tried to enlist, not tried to avoid it by going to Canada or trying to hide out. Did, did you think of leaving school to go into the uh, armed forces? Uh, no, no, I, I didn't. I wanted to get my diploma, yeah. which I did. And um, out of our graduating class, maybe one or two of the fellows, we were co-ed school, but one or two of the fellows did drop out. And I understand that as of late, because I used to be on the board of directors of the Newton, Massachusetts YMCA, and Mayor Cohen, that's the mayor of Newton, Massachusetts, um, he awarded a high school diploma to two fellows who left Newton High to join the service. I thought that was very fine. I happen to know those two fellows. But you, you decided to stick it out and, until you got out of school. And so did 99% at yeah. Brookline High. That what, what did you do then? Did you join the armed forces then? No, I, I received my draft notice. I received my draft notice and I, uh, I, I reported down to the draft board and they said you could finish your high school education uh, at the time. And uh, what happened was after, after graduation, I was with about 300 fellows at the uh, Chevrolet building on Commonwealth Avenue in Boston. And we were, be, we were being drafted into the service, whether we liked it or not, and we all liked it. And they gave you your choice of how many people would like the Marine Corps. And they did alphabetically, and I wasn't interested in the Marine Corps, and how many would like the Coast Guard. And I did raise my hand for that, but by the time they, they got to the letter K, they had their compliment that they wanted. So then they said, how many want the Navy? And I raised my hand because I always liked the water and the boating, et cetera. And uh, I got into the Navy that way. So the Army was fourth choice? The Army was not a choice. You got into the Army if you if didn't you get didn't into the other. Any of the others. That's right. Then I went to boot camp in Newport, Rhode Island. Well, tell, for two tell months. me about uh, you at home. You told your family, guess what? Uh, oh, no, they knew about it. They, they knew that I was drafted. They saw my little card that I got from the draft board. But did they know you were going into the Navy? Uh, no. no. I didn't know what service I'd be, what branch I was going into. In those days, at the beginning, they let you have your choice of service if you got a GS, G, general service on your physical. You had your choice if there was an opening. But otherwise, you'd be drafted right into the Army. So you're called up, and you are now going into the United States Navy. Right, right. Uh, you went to Newport? Rhode Island. Tell us about uh, saying goodbye to your family. Well, I never said goodbye to them. I mean, that morning we were, that afternoon, I should say, after our physical and our written tests and rigmarole of that type, uh, we went aboard a train at South Station to Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, it was late in the afternoon. We got into our barracks about 9.30 at night. And we were sleeping in hammocks for two months. I never slept in a hammock uh, during training at boot camp. A guy has told us 
that um, they had like a kind of a test to get into and out of hammocks and that if you failed or passed that test it made a difference in where you went in the Navy. Is, is that, did I that never happen had that happen. I nev we never had that happen. Did you we know that to be so? No, no, I did not. I'm not questioning the person, but <laughs> uh, there were many boot camps, uh, one in the New York area, um, I forget where it was, and the Great Lakes. and uh, Plattsburgh in, in New York, I think. I, I don't know, yeah. No, I, I never heard of that. All right, uh, you're in the Navy, you're in boot camp. Uh, what happened to you there? What did they do to you? Well, it was really, as I look back at it, it was mostly training with a rifle, which I never used in the Navy aboard ship. And it was, uh, I, I, I look back at it, it's funny you happen to bring this up now, I was just thinking of this the other day, how useless it was instead of giving us training in some specialized field because nobody in the Navy does any marching after you're out of boot camp. You're aboard a ship or uh, you're stationed on some island in the Pacific or wherever it might be. Uh, I, I, I can't, it was six weeks approximately. And we would learn, we would jog at every day, a mile or two or three. They kept you in good shape, let me put it that way. When you went into the Navy, uh, did friends, high school friends, other friends go with you in this bunch that got on the train? A few did, about two or three did, yes. So you, you knew Otherwise some guys. Otherwise they went into the know. Army or the Marine Corps. But you knew somebody in boot camp. They're, they weren't all strangers. You yes. weren't a stranger among strangers. That's right. And what were the conditions of your joining the Navy? Uh, did you sign up for a specific number of years or the duration plus six months? Something like that? I don't recall. I have a hunch it was for the duration of the war. I didn't sign any paper that I can recall where it would be for four years or eight years. It was for the, for the war I was in. Okay. And I think that goes for just about everybody. Now, how about other people that had an interview with you? Um, do they say the same thing? No, it varies. Uh, okay. Some people uh, signed up for four years. Oh and served four years. I served but four years. Other people were, uh, the, the duration, <clears throat> and then they had the point system, and the point system determined how you got out and, and when you got out. In, in boot camp, did you take tests to determine your skills, what the Navy would do with you? No, no. Did you it have any choices? It was all physical, it was jogging, it was, uh, Rifle practice, um, there were no, no tests, no. Did you, it, it, were you ever offered choices? For example, uh, you go in the Navy, Air Corps, uh, Navy carriers, uh, desk work, communications work? The only choice we had was if we wanted to go into the submarines. And that was supposedly, we were getting $60 a month pay uh, as a seaman in boot camp for those six weeks at Newport, Rhode Island. And the petty officer who was in charge of us mentioned about submarine duty that it would be double pay when you go down below the surface. And uh, that was the only option we had to go into a different field than uh, a ship or air. What did you like about boot camp? Or what did you dislike about boot camp? Uh, they, they kept you busy all the time. You didn't have too much time for yourself. Uh, I, I never, you know, you've got to realize something. I was 18 years of age. I was still a youngster. Uh, today, I think the children are more mature today uh, when they get out of high school than when I got out of high school. Uh, I, I never really gave it too much thought whether I, I, I mean, I, I, I liked it to the degree that I was going to be serving in the United States, for the United States. Six weeks goes by, uh, what did they do with you, uh, you then? Did you get to go home? Uh, 
No, 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 uh, I didn't get to go home. Uh, I did have, my mother and father did come down to Newport on a Sunday when I would have uh, an afternoon off and uh, I'd be with them. But uh, after boot camp, I went uh, to uh, New York City to uh, Pier 90, I think they called it. And um, I was supposed to go aboard a destroyer. And somehow or other, my papers got mixed up and they put me aboard a brand new Liberty ship called the SS Ada Bell Likes, L-Y-K-E-S, out of New Orleans, Louisiana. And we made a trip to Casablanca and back. We didn't have any troubles. It was a beautiful, and I was on a gun at the time. And when I got back to a, a 3.5 gun on the stern of the ship, and when I got back to New York City after my first uh, trip to Casablanca or Gibraltar it was, um, my regular papers hit me and I put it aboard this destroyer, the John D. Erickson, the DD-440, and I was on that ship during the entire war. Okay, now they put you on a destroyer to do what? What, what was your rating or well, spec? A spec number. It's funny you happen to ask about that because they've just changed that recently. I was a seaman, a seaman first class. I was not into anything that you could specifically say with signaling or quartermaster or radar, etc. And what I was doing, I hate to tell you, was just chipping paint. And they don't do that anymore. They've changed that. The Secretary of the Navy has changed that. They do the chipping of paint. They have workmen do that in the shipyards. Uh, but I began chipping paint, which was pretty menial. But anyway, the point is that after I was aboard ship for about, oh, three or four months, uh, I was sent to radio school up in Casco Bay, just outside of Portland, Maine. and. Uh, I became a radio operator. It was, I think, three months duty, and it was good duty. It was good duty. We had good food and good accommodations up there on the island. And then I went back aboard the Ericsson, and I became a third-class petty officer radio operator. So that's a promotion for you? It was a promotion, yeah. and during GQ, which is general quarters, I was on a 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun because we didn't need all the fellows in the radio room when we were at, in battle. And I knew how to work on a, on a gun because they gave me that lesson at boot camp in Newport. You used the term uh, a, a few minutes before we began this interview, a tin can. Um, I always think of destroyers looking at them objectively or subjectively, I'm not quite sure, as pretty rough riding, that they're, they're a small ship, smaller than I'd be comfortable in. True. How was it riding around in one of those things? Uh, true, uh, especially in rough water. Uh, sometimes we would get submarine pay, and other times we would get flight pay. That's what we used to kid about. Uh, the bow would go underneath, or sometimes it would go up high. Had you ever been to sea before this, notwithstanding your trip to uh, Casablanca? No. But as a kid, had you ever gone sailing, anything like yeah, that? Yes, sailing and outboard motorboat. I have a boat now down in Florida. And how did it go on a rough ship? How, how did you do on this? I was, I was very fortunate. I only got seasick once because sometimes the destroyer could go 35 knots, which is pretty fast pretty fast. Did your ship have a specific area that you patrolled in or went in? Did you, did you know every time you left the dock where you were going? No, 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 no. Tell us some places you went. Well, we were in the invasion of southern France at Marseille and Toulon. We were in the battles of Anzio and Casino in the Mediterranean. Uh, we visited ports that normally I would never get to see in my, my lifetime. Uh, we did convoy duty. Uh, wherever we were ordered to, we, were, we went. 
after Italy and Germany surrendered, we were ordered to the Pacific. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that eventually. Sure. But, uh, which of these events took place first? Uh, the invasion of southern France? No, the Battle of Anzion Casino. Okay, would you tell us about that? Well, we were in a flotilla of other destroyers and DE's destroyer escorts, and we were bombarding shore installations. We were about maybe two miles from shore with our five-inch guns. And uh, we got hit in the waterline by return fire of the Germans or the Italians, whoever were shooting at us, probably both. And we had to go to Palermo, Sicily to get repaired. We lost all our drinking water. And for three or four days, uh, to take a shower, we'd be using salt water. And one thing I learned that I never knew about, and maybe you never heard about it either, there's a soap, a salt water soap. It doesn't create a lather. And we had it aboard ship, a salt water soap, when we would take a shower. And we were drinking fruit juices, but then we got repaired in uh, Palermo, Sicily, which was right nearby. When you were uh, firing your guns, um at the shore, five-inch guns, I take it? Yes. Uh, this is in defense of the Fifth Army, Mark Clark and his people uh, after the invasion. Right. Um, how close to shore were you? Did, could, did you know what you, your ship was shooting at? Yes, we, we, were, we were instructed by a Piper Cub that had radio communication with the destroyers. And that's how we knew. I cannot, um, I have never been in a situation such as you're describing. Were you uh, up on deck behind a gun now? Yes, you I would 40 be. 40 millimeters? That's right. Yeah. Were, was there a lot of, uh, was there any uh, German aircrafts, uh, any planes? Uh, very, very few. When I say very few, maybe five or ten that we would see. And we would, we did not knock any down but we did fire upon them. And you're firing at the shore. How long did this go on? This Several went on for days. around yeah. 10 days. Yes. Did you have to go somewhere to get more ammunition or was it brought to you? No, we had enough ammunition aboard, we did. To fire for 10 days? Well, not continually, 24 no. hours a day. No. no. And then uh, w w tell us about we would, what was around you, other excuse ships. Excuse me, let me interrupt you. You're, you're absolutely right. We did go into Palermo, Sicily to get uh, more ammunition. We did. Uh, it was a short run, maybe about a two-hour run from Anzio and Casino at the yeah. Mediterranean. Sicily was right nearby. Tell us about being part of a fleet. I think you said flotilla a, a moment ago. What's it like? to sit out there and you're firing and other ships. Describe the picture of where you were. Well, as I mentioned, we were about two miles offshore approximately, and there were other destroyers right nearby us. And they were in the same situation that they were being told where to put their shells. Uh, in, in back of us, probably two or three miles in back of us, there were cruisers, no battleships, but there were cruisers, light cruisers and heavy cruisers, and they were bombarding also. Shooting up over your head. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. How their fire was directed, I don't know. Were you present at the invasion itself? Did you see them go ashore at Anzio? Uh, no, no, we came in about a day or two later, we, I understand. And I did not see them go on the LST, the landing ship tanks, or the LCI, the landing craft infantry. Uh, I did not see them go ashore. Where had you come from? Where did your, uh, where did your flotilla gather? Well, we, we gathered in the Mediterranean, uh, right near Palermo, Sicily. That's where we gathered. And from there, we went right up on the Mediterranean again, the blue Mediterranean, beautiful. Uh, we had just gotten through convoy duty, and uh, that's how we got involved. When you look back at that, 
um, I, I envy you that you, you were part of history and saw those things. Um, anything that sticks out, any particular incident about being off that coast and firing these guns, did, could you observe your hits? No. We were told by the aircraft what we did. <laughs> Matter of fact, I don't know if he was kidding or not, and this goes back, you know, uh, 50 odd years ago. Yeah. He said, uh, Erickson, you just hit an outhouse. I'll never forget that. We laughed. <laughs> Maybe he was on the loudspeaker. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you were aiming at it. <laughs> you just hit an outhouse. And you're, you're firing uh, 40 millimeter guns. This is the, the pom-poms, is that Right, it? right. Uh, were you strictly anti-aircraft or were you shooting at the shore? No, we were aircraft. And, and the same goes for the 20 millimeter fellows. Yeah. We had 20 millimeter, 40 millimeter, and a five inch. We had two five inch mounts forward and two five inch mounts in the stern. And then the later destroyers that were built in 1943 and 44, they had double five inch mounts forward, two of them, and double five inch mounts in the stern. As a radio man or a communicator, yeah. Um, when you're not firing your guns, what what were you doing in the radio shack? Uh, typing on a typewriter with the earphones, taking down the Morse code. And what kind of breaking signal, it down in English? What kind of signals were you getting from whom? Um, we really weren't getting signals, we were just getting reports, weather reports, reports of uh, convoys that are nearby where we are. Um, we, we could not send anything out, we were just listening uh, because we wouldn't want anyone to know where we were. So we were just taking messages that would come over continually, continually. Uh, they would come out 24 hours a day. They would never stop. Let's see if I uh, have a picture of you. You're, uh, when you're in an, in an invasion situation, when you were up on deck firing, who's minding the store for or signals coming in, messages uh, coming in? There were, there were quite a few of us. There were about eight operators. And uh, we would work eight hours on and then we would have the rest of the time off. But we'd work for usually eight hours. Uh, sometimes we would space it and we'd work for four, we'd work something out with somebody and we'd work for four hours. And uh, as far as General Quarters was concerned, we didn't have to have all the operators in the radio room. You only needed four at a time. There were four places, or I think three or four places for us to sit, and three or four typewriters. So the other fellows would be at general quarters, no matter what time of day it was. And sometimes you'd be at general quarters for four or five hours at a time, manning the guns. Where were you when you were hit? I was on a 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. It was hit on the water line of our destroyer. Was there a big explosion? Uh, no, 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 didn't even hardly know it, except we didn't have any water. And uh, I, I guess some people knew that we were hit. I, I did not know it at the time. You know, you're asking me questions that <laughs> I'm ashamed of myself that I don't vividly remember everything, and I, I should supposedly, but. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Well, thank you, thank you. <laughs> After the invasion, it, it, finally they all got ashore. It was, if I remember, it was touch and go that uh, whether or not they were going to be able to stay on the beach, and they finally got ashore. Uh, did you guys withdraw and go somewhere else? Yes, yes. Um, we uh, we we got into the. Inv I, I don't know the timing. I really forget, but I know our next major episode was the invasion of southern France at Marseille and Toulon. 
and that harbor was cluttered with sunken ships. We did get ashore at Marseille. We did get ashore. That means you did? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Tell us about that. Well, it, uh, we got ashore after we had conquered or uh, rid the Germans or the Italians who were fighting us. And it was what we called a liberty. We had liberty there. And uh, uh, it was bombed quite a bit. It, it was the, the city of Marseille was quite damaged. And uh, we were in the harbor there. We, we pulled up to a dock. We pulled up to a dock. But in the harbor, I remember seeing so many ships uh, sunk. You, uh, you could see their bows or their sterns up in the air. Uh, that, that was something. But the French treated us very nicely. They were happy to see us. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, the previous invasion uh, in North Africa, they were not happy to see you. Uh, I was in Algiers, Casablanca, Gibraltar. Uh, they seemed to be friendly to us in comparison to what the Germans had done to them, especially in Marseille. Uh, Tell us about, now, who went ashore uh, at Marseille? Is we all did. Army units? No, uh, oh. other than Liberty. Uh, was this the United States Army going in there? Yes. Yes. This was Churchill's soft underbelly of Europe phrase. They were starting an, an invasion, although we literally the length of France. I never met any of the army fellows that I can recall in Marseille or Toulon. I was in both places. But uh, the French were very cordial to us in every respect. Uh, I think because we liberated them, technically speaking, from German rule. How old were you at this time, Jack? Oh, I was about uh, 19 and a half, something 19 like and a half? Yeah. Did you ever twenty stand outside yourself and look at this kid from Brookline, Massachusetts, and where you are, and what you're doing, and think about uh, you? You were really part of history. No, I never did because I think that there were so many of us, and we we're all about the same age, and. Uh, I, I never looked upon it that way, never. I never. Today, the children today who are graduating high school and college, they hardly know anything about World War II. They don't study it. I've spoken to many of them. And my own four children who are very bright, uh, I've shown them pictures. I have a lot of pictures. And they love to look at them. But they, they never really studied World War II. Oh, there's, there have been intervening wars, and um, send them to see this new picture, Pearl Harbor. And I'm going to watch it. I'm going to go see it, sure. I didn't ask you before, when you were off the coast of Italy, about the United States air power over your head. Um, what did you see when you looked up? If there were no German planes, what was up there? No, the, the, uh, I, I didn't see any of ours. I didn't see any of ours at the time. Yeah. And how about here off Marseille? Did you have air cover? No, not that I know of. Believe it or not, it was just naval. Yeah. And what, were there other larger ships with you? In the background, uh, there were the, the cruisers ships that couldn't again. get into the harbor because yeah. of their uh, their size. We were lucky, being on a destroyer or a destroyer escort, we could pull right into the dock. We were fortunate. Were you considered a DE rather than? No, we were a no. DD. You were a oh, a destroyer, you were a absolute destroyer. Yes. Were the clothes, the equipment, everything the United States Navy gave you adequate for what you had to do? Definitely. Were you well prepared? And and your training as a um, radio operator. Other than that. When they, they sent you to operate the guns, where did you get that training on the guns? 
I got that really at boot camp to a degree, but not on a 40 millimeter. I got it for rifle training and uh, a 20 millimeter, which are the smaller gun. It's, uh, but really getting up into uh, uh, the, the pod for a, a, uh, a pair of pom poms, that's, that's no rifle. No. Where did no. you get that training? Right on ship. The other, the other gunnery petty officers uh, taught me all that they knew. Can you tell us the process by which you were supposed to bring down airplanes? Well, I was a loader. In other words, I, I would load the shells into the 40 millimeter. I did not aim it. All I, uh, I was a loader on the 40 millimeter Randy. Did they come in clips? Uh, yes. If I recall correctly, there were four, four shells in a clip on a 40 millimeter. And you're handing them to the, to the gunner, to the shooter? I'm putting them right in the gun. Okay, and then he's shooting. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm, I've used the word before, but I, it must, that must be very exciting to be part of that and, and firing at uh, live targets. Uh, you know, you train a lot and you train a lot. But suddenly you're on a ship shooting at, at shore uh, targets. I suppose if I was older, if I was 25 or 30 years of age, I might have stopped to do more thinking. But at my age of 18, 19, 20, uh, I just did things mechanically. And uh, I never gave myself any credit, and I still don't. It's just one of those things. There are so many million there approximately 14 million that served men and women. I think after the war, we see a lot of pictures about guys on submarines. They're jammed in and they sleep five in a bunk and all of that. How many men were on your ship? And what was life like on board a destroyer? Uh, we had approximately on ours 250 men. And uh, we had our own bunk, our own sack. They were four high. Whereby on a submarine, you only can use it for eight hours, and then two other people use it eight hours and eight hours, total 24. Um, but on a destroyer, we, uh, we didn't have the life of a person on a battleship or a heavy cruiser that would have movies, would have uh, an ice cream bar, <laughs> <laughs> Etc. Uh, ours was a fighting ship, and uh, it, it, it was clean duty. It was clean duty. In other words, in comparison to the army, where they'd sleep in a foxhole, uh, we had a little. We had a washer and a dryer, a big one aboard ship. I never handled it, but we had clean uniforms. We could take a shower every day, and. Uh, it, it, it was good duty. It was good duty. I have no complaints. When you finished with a particular assignment, um, you finished at Marseille. How did you know where you were going to go next? Did, were you called together? Or you now hear this, now hear this? You get it over the loudspeaker? No, no, we never knew. We never knew. You, you would leave a harbor and not know where you're going? That is true. The, the commanding officer, the lieutenant commander, uh, Charlie Baldwin, I'm sure he confronted his other, we had about 12 officers aboard ship, and uh, I'm sure he confronted them with the secret orders, but we were never really told until we were on our way, on our way we would be told. But they did eventually tell you yes, you're heading for, yes. you're going back to Palermo to pick up more armament, something That's like that. That's right, food. Yeah. Yeah. What about Scuttlebutt? <laughs> what a word, I haven't heard that in a long time. Um, I, I can't give you any answer on that. I, I don't know how, how we handled that. I, I forget. No wild rumors that we're going to sail to Berlin or something no, like that? No, 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 no. Did your, you feel your officers gave you uh, 
good leadership? They were good, solid Navy yes, types? Yes, yes, yes. Do you remember any of them in particular? Oh, sure, sure. Charlie, you just remembered? Well, mentioned. that was our lieutenant commander. He was the captain. No matter what his rank was, if you're in charge of a ship, even if you're an ensign on a PT boat, you're called captain if you're in charge of that ship or a PT boat or a submarine. And, uh, oh, I, I remember their names. Uh, I've lost... We have reunions. Our destroyer has reunions uh, nearly every year. And uh, the only officer that comes to them, the reunions, happens to be the captain. He lives in Florida, his name's Charlie Baldwin, as I mentioned, and he does come to the reunions. They're usually two or three day reunions. When you guys get together, um, do you talk about what you did or what you're doing? I thought maybe you were going to say to me, do I ever go to a reunion? But you went one step ahead. You asked, what do I do at the reunion and what we talk about? I've never gone to a reunion. Hypothetically, if you went to a reunion. But I had one at my house. Oh, you did? Yes, and within the Dover Sherman paper, I should have brought it to you. I have a copy of the uh, picture. And I had 18 men come with their wives or with their girlfriends, and this was eight years ago. All right, that was a semi A mini. Yeah. What did you talk about? Well, we all brought pictures. You talk about your kids, or you talk about what happened 50 years ago. We hadn't seen each other in a long time. Yeah. And uh, we brought pictures of, of our family. I mean, it was at my house. And uh, we did talk about the service and about uh, the invasion, about the battles, et cetera, we did. Yeah. After uh, Marseille and, and being there, where did you go? Well, right, uh, the war ended really. Germany, within a period of, uh, I don't know how many months, maybe, or, or six months it was, um, we, we went, we were ordered to the Pacific. Okay, so that's the end of Europe for you. Right, right, right. Um, did you feel as the war is winding down and you know Berlin is about to fall on May 8th or whatever comes along. Did you feel the war is going to be over for you or did you guys talk about now we're going to go to the Pacific? Now we're going to have to go to the Pacific? I hate to say this to you but we did not know that Berlin was falling. We did not know we, we didn't get any of that news. We didn't get newspapers. Um, we didn't know and I'm speaking for the rest of the fellows aboard ship. Uh, we weren't in contact with what was going on. We were just living day for day and uh, following our orders. There was no naval equipment, uh, equivalent of the Stars and Stripes? You didn't get any newspapers occasionally? I never saw one. I never saw one. What about in the Radio Shack? Uh, you're not hearing anything? No, 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 no. Remember, it was in code. Yeah. It was in code. And you would give the reports to the communication officer, and he would go into the code room and break it down in English. So we didn't know what we were. We were just putting down letters. So. There came a time when surely you knew, you guys knew that the war in Europe was over. Uh, where were you at that point? We were someplace in the, we were off the island of Elba. And I think that's uh, someplace outside of France. I, I really should know, but I don't. And uh, we heard that we were going back to the States because Germany and Italy, Italy surrendered and then Germany surrendered later on. And uh, that's where we were. And not knowing that we were going back to the States, our orders were to go to the Pacific. But we did go to, uh, we got down to uh, Hollywood, Florida, where we anchored for a, 
a day and got some more supplies. And then we went through the Panama Canal and up to San Diego where they took off our torpedo tubes and gave us more armament because of the Japanese airplanes. But we never, never saw any action in the Pacific. We never had any invasions or anything. And we got to quite a few of the islands and when we got, go okay. ahead. All right, we'll, we'll get there in a second. I, I, I want to uh, finish off with Europe by, by asking you what you felt the greatest challenges you as an individual faced while you were in combat? Well, uh, <laughs> there's an old saying, there are no atheists in foxholes. To begin with, I'm not an atheist. But uh, when we were getting bombarded uh, from the Germans or the Italians at Anzio and Casino, uh, this was at night time they were fighting us and we didn't know where to fight back and I, uh, one of the fellows got hit uh, by shrapnel and he was right nearby me and I went down on my hands and knees. I can remember this as though it was yesterday. I looked up to the Lord above. I said, please, not me next. But we had one thing in mind when you're in battle like that and that is uh, you don't have too much time to think about yourself, technically speaking. You, 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 you just don't want to get hurt. You don't want to get hit. You don't want to get killed. Um, and there are no atheists in foxholes. Jack, when we, uh, before we started the tape, you and I were talking and you mentioned the sinking of a submarine, uh, which we haven't touched on yet. Tell us about that. Where were you, how this came about, and what happened? Well, a destroyer has soundar gear, which is below the ship. The radar gear is for airplanes or ships on the water. And the soundar gear is for submarines. And uh, we located one with the t type of soundar gear that they have aboard the ship. And the destroyer escorts, they have that same type of soundar gear. And uh, we were, we, we sent out, we, we must have used about 10 or 12 depth charges that went off the stern of the ship. Where were you? Where was I at the time? No, where was the ship? Uh, this was in the North Atlantic, and I, I can't tell you exactly where it was. Not that it's a secret, I, I just don't know. And uh, debris started to come up above and there was hardly any more notice of a submarine below the surface. And uh, we knew we got a sub. Was the ship credited with yes, the sinking? Yes, we did. Yeah. So you, you did get it then? We got a presidential citation. Were you on deck when they were dropping the, uh, the depth charges? I was in the radio shack. Yeah, I was in the radio shack. But when a depth charge goes off, it raises the ship, the concussion, uh, the small destroyer. You're in a, a small compartment way below decks. No, I'm above deck. Are you? I'm sorry. Yes. Where are you? Up by the bridge then? Uh, not that high. Not that high. And but we're above deck. So you're, you're not confined downstairs? No. Listening to all these muffled explosions? Down below we are not, no. But we could feel the, the concussion when the depth charge would explode. You're at general quarters? We weren't at general quarters when they did that, but maybe we should have been, but we weren't. Because there was nothing on, the only people that were really working were the uh, fellows who handled the depth charges. Were there other, were, were you the other ship chasing this sub or were others part of this? Were you part of a we group? Were the, we were the only one within a vicinity of eyesight. Did you ever learn after the war which sub you had no. sunk? No, 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 no. But it's part of your ship's history. That's very interesting. Yes, yes. Okay, now you're in San Diego, California. Right. Now tell us, going, going through the uh, Panama Canal, tell us what that was like. 
that was quite an experience. Uh, we we uh, stopped, uh, our destroyer stopped before we went through the canal, and uh, I wish I could remember the names of the cities uh, that we stopped at there. And then we went through the canal, and when we got through the canal, uh, believe it or not, we went swimming in the water. We <laughs> it was very hot down there. And uh, we went swimming for about a half an hour or so, and then we went up to San Diego. And we were in San Diego for about a week. And you said they took off your uh, torpedo tubes? Right. Is, uh, torpedo launchers. Is this because of the kamikaze effect right. on the other end? That's right. What had you heard? What had you heard about the kamikazes? Well, that they were the suicide type, they were suicide people. And uh, What replaced the torpedo launchers? We, more, more 40 millimeters? And 20. 20 millimeters. 20 too. and 40, that's yeah. right. More armament, that's right. So more anti-aircraft guns rather True. than torpedoes. That's right. Well, that makes sense. Okay, you uh, sailed out of uh, San Diego. Did you get at liberty there, I hope? Yes, we did. For, we were there for a week. And then from there we went to uh, Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, we were there for about two or three days, and from there we went to the Philippines. This is about June Manila. June or July of 45? Yes, I would say so. Yes, I would say so. What did, what did, uh, what did you see in Pearl Harbor? We, we got ashore only, I only got ashore once. You went into Honolulu? That's right, that's right, only once. And uh, the submarine, uh, the destroyer pens were, did you see any, the, the, the remains of the Arizona? Did no, I didn't. Did you see the Utah, any of these no, ships? No, no, I never did. I never saw those. And you were there how long? Uh, just a few days, maybe four or five days, tops. And again, you had no idea where you were going out into the Pacific, right? No, no, no idea. You went to the Philippines? After, after Pearl Harbor, that's right. Manila. And what, what did Manila look like? That was pretty, that was pretty much bombed out. Pretty that, beat up, yeah, wasn't that it? Was yeah, that was pretty beat up. Yeah. The Japanese had been there for quite a while. And uh, we were only there approximately uh, four or five days. I got ashore once or twice. And uh, it, it was poor. The people got uh, really ruled pretty strongly by the Japanese. And again, here's another place that they were elated to see us, the Americans. What did you, f uh, what were you told you're, you were going to do? Um, you supported landings in Europe. Uh, did you think you were on your way to some invasion? What, what did you feel your objectives were? We never knew until after the war we were told what was going to happen to us, what we were going to do. Because from Manila we went to Okinawa. And it was either at Okinawa or one of the islands that we were told about Nagasaki and Hiroshima and then about the war ending. At, at, at Okinawa were you supporting troops on shore? No, no, no. We were unknown to us, we were getting ready for the invasion of Japan, unknown to us. Thousands and thousands would have been killed, Japanese and Americans. Luckily, Harry Truman ordered the atom bomb dropped. Otherwise, it would be devastating for the Japanese and for us too in the invasion up the East China Sea. And we eventually, we were the first American ship 
to land at Sasebo in the island of Kyushu, which is the third largest naval base. You were at Sasebo, and this is a few miles from Nagasaki. Uh, probably a few hundred miles. Probably a few hundred miles. We came within 25 miles of Nagasaki after the bomb was dropped, but we wouldn't come any closer because of radioactivity and um, gases. So we stayed approximately 20, I never, we never got to see through the naked eye uh, Nagasaki or Hiroshima. So you're docked in Japan right, right after the war? Right after the war. Tell us what you saw there. Well, <laughs> we, we, we got ashore. We got ashore. And I have pictures of this in my house of when we walked ashore, the Japanese would turn their heads the other way. They had nothing, to, they didn't want anything to do with us. And of course, we couldn't speak their language and they couldn't speak our language. Uh, the Japanese naval ships that were tied up at the dock there, they were old looking. Some of the destroyers used coal. We were amazed to see that. Mm. They used coal, not oil, to maneuver their ships. Uh, and uh, there was no more fighting. No, no shots were fired. You were, you were uh, U.S. Navy sailors walking around. Who, who did you see? Uh, Unsure that representing the United States were the Army, Marines, any who was there? No, I, I, we were the we were the first ship, and I, I don't I, I don't think there were any Army or Navy ahead of us. Uh, the war was over. I guess the Japs were told no more fighting. The Emperor says so. Do you feel safe? The there? only people that we saw ashore were civilians, men and women. Uh, I didn't see any armed services of any others, whereby in the European area, yes, we did see many army men uh, in Marseille and Toulon. Tell us about being among the very first in Japan. The, the, the people averted their faces, looked away from you. That's right. You never got to talk to any of them? Never. Never. What were you doing ashore? <laughs> I, I guess to just say we were on Japanese soil uh, to see if the shops had anything for sale as souvenirs, which they didn't. Uh, I, I guess just the sightseeing. Uh, nobody went far inside of Sasebo. We stayed near the dock, maybe five or six blocks away. But uh, just to say we were there. What did your ship pull in there for? Did you go in for supplies or water? No, Shoot. no. Uh, you're asking me a question which I, I can't give you an answer. Be I don't know. When you were sailing there, say coming over from Okinawa or uh, up to Kyushu, um, were you with other ships? Were you part of a, a group of ships, destroyers or destroyers and cruisers, battleships? Who, who was with you? There were just two other destroyers. No battle wagons or cruisers or DEs, just two others. And uh, we stayed there about a week. And then we headed back to the States. I was going to ask you, you were Right, this was the launching point for MacArthur's invasion of Korea, or coming back up to Korea um, in five years from then. You never got over across the Sea of Japan to see any of Korea. Or None. Nothing. You went back home. That's right. And what? When is this? The war is over. The bombs 46. have been dropped. Right. And uh, you're going home finally. You'd been in the Navy four years. Right. Where did you sail to? 
Well, we eventually, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, where we put our ship in mothballs. Did you go through the canal again? Yes, yes, sure. So you'd say I'd been here before, <laughs> been there, done that. <laughs> right, right, right. And you get up to Charleston. Were you under the point system now? Uh, yes, I, I wasn't married and I didn't have any children. And uh, But you had a lot of overseas time. Yes, yes, but there were a lot of fellows who got off, who got out of the service ahead of me from our ship because they were older and some were married and some had children. And at any time other than liberties ashore in, in places where you one or two days, were you on that ship four years, three years? Did you ever get off and get liberty or go home? Did you ever get a furlough? No, we never got a furlough, no. Um, the only time I got home was when I was at radio school up in Casco Bay outside of Portland, Maine. I'd get home on the weekends. And uh, that's the only time that I can recall that I'd ever get home. Uh, that's the only time. You'd been, you, that's called continuous service. You, you were in there a long time. Yes. Without a break. Now you're in Charleston, South Carolina, right? And you did you find this to be a strange country, or <laughs> <laughs> were you glad to be home again? Oh, sure, we're glad to be home, but uh, where where were you discharged then? Uh, I was discharged in Boston from the Fargo Building. So you got on a train or a bus and on a train, yeah, on a train after we put the ship in mothballs, and. Uh, That's when I got discharged. Do you know whatever happened to your ship? Yes, I do. I do. Funny I happened to bring that up. It was used for target practice about 15 years later. First the Germans and now... <laughs> <laughs> and it was sunk. <laughs> yeah. Where was it sunk? I, I, I don't know. Sometimes they sink ships to make reefs, but uh, yeah, I know, yeah, this, yeah. this was just That's some, right, that's right. Well, evidently they hit it. Yeah. Any time when you were uh, ashore or tied up at, at docks places, did you run into uh, other guys from other navies, the British Navy, for example, Canadians? Yes, yes, yes. In the European area, yes. And when we landed at Malta, uh, we ran into, I remember, British sailors. You you pulled into Valletta? Malta. Okay. I never heard that word, Valletta. That's the capital of Malta. I, I never heard of it, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Tell us about that, the most bomb spot in the world. Right, that's right. That's Was that right. full of sunken ships and docks and... Uh, no, the, uh, the, the, the harbor wasn't, uh, the, the city was bombed quite a bit, but very interesting, in, in Malta, um, there weren't any wooden houses, if I recall correctly. We mentioned that. There, most of them were brick or stone, and they weren't that badly damaged, but it was supposedly one of the heaviest bomb places in the world. Malta was. Called the unsinkable aircraft carrier. Yeah, we were there when they uh, had an uh, air raid. Uh, the German planes came over. We never expected it. And uh, I guess we, that was only once. We were there for a good week or so and uh, getting supplies. And the Germans came over and uh, let go a few bombs. That's a dangerous place to go to. Yeah. Uh, you must have really needed supplies or something. I, again, you know, I wasn't on the inn. Tell us other places that I haven't asked you about because I didn't know you were there. But if you were in Malta, you obviously went through the Straits of Gibraltar. And That's what right. other places did you go to? Naples. And then from Naples, we uh, went to the Isle of Capri on our own, not the ship. 
So the Blue Grotto. That's right. We, we, with a rowboat, you go into the Blue Grotto. That's right. And where else? <laughs> uh, well, um, Mount Vesuvius erupted when we were in the harbor <laughs> at Naples. And uh, our ship was covered. We weren't on a dock at the time. We, we left the dock. We heard that Mount Vesuvius was going to erupt. So we went out into the harbor. And our ship got covered with soot. I'll never forget that. It took us uh, days to clean up the, uh, the ship. Um, but um, we, we were in most of the ports around the Mediterranean, Casablanca, Gibraltar, uh, Naples, as I mentioned, um, quite a few of those ports there. Anything in North Africa? Tunis. Um, Algiers. Algiers, yeah. Dirty place, dirty. And uh, Did it occur to you that you got a, a heck of a ride in the United States Navy? Many times. Yeah. As I mentioned at the beginning, I got to a place that normally I would never get to see, and many, many Americans would never get to see on their own volition. Did, yeah, you, so. did you ever go, go back to any place? Uh, <laughs> um, I have traveled Europe with my wife, but we've, uh, we've been to Rome this time and Florence, places that I didn't get to see. We never got to Naples, where I was, or the Isle of Capri, where we places like that. And I've never been to uh, the Pacific. Uh, Honolulu again, or any of the islands, of course. I have no desire anymore. I'm very happy in Dover, and we live in Florida during the winter months. Well, you may sail your ship down through the Panama Canal once and <laughs> see if it still works. <laughs> Can you tell us, Jack, if there was a, a, of all the things that you saw and all the places you went, was there's one outstanding one, a most memorable experience in your career in the United States Navy? Well, of course, as I, as I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, to go ashore in Japan to have the civilians turn their heads the other way, that's something you'll never forget. Uh, it was one of the few places that we ever landed that they weren't happy to see us and pleasant to us. Uh, they. Just kept, just kept talking. I mean, just kept walking away from us. Uh, that's one one thing that I'll never forget. And um, the USO was very, very good to us uh, servicemen. I spent Christmas in Oran and North Africa, and when I spent it, it happened to be my birthday, Christmas Eve, born December twenty fourth. 1924, as I mentioned to you, uh, and uh, it, it was tough to be away on, on Christmas Eve like that. But we, a few of us, went to the USO there, and they were very hospitable and very pleasant. And I remember that. Did they sing Happy Birthday to you? No, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Of all the people you met, and you must have met a, a lot of them beyond your shipmates or with your shipmates, was there a most memorable character, some guy or somebody that you remember? You know, I wish I knew some of these questions ahead of time. <laughs> I would have stopped to think about it. Uh, no, not necessarily, not necessarily. No. I know you went through a lot of horrendous experiences, but was there a humus, humorous experience, something that was absolutely funny that you can still remember? Well, there was a, let, let me change that a little bit, there was a sort of a bad experience. Uh, when I left the, uh, the Liberty ship and I uh, went aboard the destroyer for the first time, it was in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I had a very bad cold and I had a fever. 
And I went into, I was, never bought a destroyer before, and I went aboard, and I went down to my bunk, and uh, I had called up my folks before I got on the destroyer, and they knew I sounded awful. Well, lo and behold, my father, my father went to the high school of commerce, and he graduated with a man that he was very friendly with, who became an admiral. And he called up the admiral, he located him, and where was the admiral? He was in charge of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So he told my father to come down and we'll go see Jack Jr. and see how he's doing. So my father and the admiral came aboard, never an admiral aboard a destroyer, came aboard the destroyer. I'm down in my bunk and the officer on deck nearly fainted as an admiral would come with a civilian, my dad, and they wanted to see Jack Shepard Jr. Well, the officer deck with a Lieutenant J.G., and he said, certainly. He said, let me get our captain first. So they got Charlie Baldwin. What can I do for you? Well, we'd like to see Jack Shepard, Jr. And uh, the captain said, well, I'll take you down to his bunk. And the admiral, from what my father said, he said, no, we want to go down without you. Yes, sir, the captain said. That was bad, that was bad. Just like your mother coming to school, isn't it? So they came down to see me, and uh, then they had the doctor come down. Well, my name was not Jack Shepard Jr. after that, it was Jack Mudd Jr. <laughs> and <laughs> but I outlived it, I outlived it, I outlived it. But that was, a, that was something that you happened to mention. That speaks well for the Admiral, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> With what, uh, what was your rank when you were discharged, Jack? I was a petty officer, third class, second class. I got second class, uh, radio. So you really did get promotions as you went along. Yes, yes. Very yes. good for you. Yeah, yeah. And w with what decorations, what ribbons? Well, we got battle stars and we got the European ribbon, we got the Pacific ribbon, uh, we had about two or three battle stars on our European uh, ribbon, but no battle stars on the Pacific. We, we didn't do anything in the Pacific. The war ended by the time we got to Saipan or Okinawa. You haven't mentioned good conduct. Is that because the uh, Admiral came aboard? Or? No, I think, uh, I think everybody got that, just about they got a discharge. Uh, I think we did, yeah. Did you join a reserve unit after no. coming home, something like that? No. Did you join any veterans organizations? No. And, and any particular reason why or why not? No, there was no reason why. Um, uh, no, there's no reason why. I belong to what's called the Tin Can Sailors which are the volunteer, we pay $15 a month, a year to belong, and we get a publication that comes out of Somerset, Massachusetts. Uh, as I mentioned to you outside, there are about 22,000 of these sailors that belong to this tin can sailors. And we get a publication that comes out every quarter of various destroyer, the reunions, and uh, what's going on. What were your feelings about being home? Um, the war is over. You did more than your part in it. Uh, how did you feel about being home? Never gave it much thought, really. Did you sit down with your family and tell them where you'd been, what you'd done? Oh, they knew where I was all the time. Did you sit down at a kitchen table some night and say, this is what I've seen? Uh, tell oh, them yes, about I, I had a lot know? of pictures and um, I had access to a typewriter, so I wrote my folks nearly every day. And my father collected and kept all my mail. Does it still exist? In shoe boxes. I have a few of them in my house, <laughs> believe it or not. How important to you, Jack, was serving in the military? Very important. 
very important. I would have felt awful if I couldn't serve, I'm sure, because all my friends were in. Do you feel it in some way affected your life? Oh, no. No. What, what did you think then, back in 1942, and what do, you, what do you think now about the war you served in? Well, it was something necessary that we had to do. It was a must. Uh, uh, go a little further. Ex I don't know exactly what you're looking at. Uh, uh, it's possible that, uh, not particularly you, but some people have, have second thoughts about their military service. They had one idea when they entered it, and they felt differently when they come out of it. Evidently, you did not. World War II you're talking about? Well, I, mean, I don't know about any other war. I was never in any other service. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, so you felt fine at both ends of it. Oh, yes. And all my friends the same way. Looking at the experiences of others, do you feel there was a difference in public opinion regarding veterans who served in World War II, Korea, Vietnam or other wars? Yes. Uh, the, the other wars that we had our conflicts with, uh, we weren't defending our country, technically speaking. We were defending their country, uh, whereby World War II we were defending Japan was out to get us. Germany was out to get us eventually, too. But uh, I can't compare the two, really. Uh, it wasn't a world war. It was a war. But, uh, Have you received any veterans' benefits, such as um, hospitalization, GI Bill, insurance, anything like that? Only three months ago, did I sign up with the Veterans Administration in Framingham so I could get my prescriptions at a reduced price? You only, waited a long time, Jack. <laughs> only two months ago. Isn't it funny I have to mention that. Is there, above all, every, everything that you've said in the last hour and um, 22 minutes, is there one thought or incident that I haven't asked you about that you would like to be part of this tape? No, there, there really isn't. Uh, again, I want to reiterate verbatim and say to you that uh, in 1942, 1943, there were very, very, very few conscientious objectors who didn't want to fight. There were very few in comparison to the ones who did want to fight, who did want to join the service. Uh, it was a completely different war than the skirmishes or the fighting that we had in Korea or the Vietnam. I think you can appreciate that too. You and I are around the same age within five or ten years, whatever it is. Oh, I'm 26 years younger than you are, Jack. No, no, no. You, you might be <laughs> 10 or 15 years younger. No, believe me. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to make part of this tape? No, I, I, I can't think of anything. Tomorrow I'll think of something. Yeah. <laughs> and that's driving the way it home, is. Driving home. Thank you for coming oh, in. Oh, sir. We appreciate it very sir. much. Right.